Mainstream Young Earth organizations have a favorite pastime of pointing to all sorts of ancient literary sources and artifacts that they think show humans and dinosaurs lived alongside each other. In this video, I'm going to be responding to the Creation Museum's claims in this regard since no such critique exists on YouTube to my knowledge, and I'm really sick of seeing this stuff being taught to kids. Later at some point I'm probably going to make a presentation providing my own counter explanation as to why it is I believe traditional civilizations all around the globe actually tend to believe in the past existence of dragons, because I think the real reason is actually incredibly fascinating. But first lads, on with the archaeological bloodshed. We'll start with the intro to this Creation Museum lecture. I am President and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. Thanks for joining us in Legacy Hall to hear from one of our excellent speakers, Brian Osborne. Brian holds a bachelor's degree in biblical studies and a master's in education. For 13 years, Brian boldly taught Bible history in the public school system. He since joined Answers in Genesis as our curriculum specialist and a very popular speaker. Now, let's give our full attention and a warm welcome to Brian Osborne. But also, all around the world we find drawings on pottery, on cave walls that appears to be clearly showing dinosaurs. And this stuff is just littered all over the world. It's amazing. I'll give you a few examples of that. Here's a piece of Egyptian pottery that shows two long-necked dinosaurs. You can go to northern England, visit the tomb of uh, Carlisle Cathedral, the tomb of Bishop Bell. Around the 15th century is when he died, when they actually put this tomb in there before dinosaurs had been found and renamed back in the 1800s. And if you look around his tomb, there's brass carvings of animals, and some of those animals look clearly like known types of dinosaurs. A copy of the Egyptian Narmer tablet is displayed in the Creation Museum lobby, as I've documented in this photograph from my last visit. Tim Cleary, a research associate at the Institute for Creation Research, also shows an image of this tablet in his book, agreeing that the artifact, quote, suggests that dinosaur-like animals coexisted with humans. In reality, every basic published resource you can find on this stone explains that it depicts serpent-necked lions, a mythological animal common to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. It's standard for Egyptian palettes like this to have a depressed circle in the center, in which cosmetics were mixed. On the Narmer stone, this mixing cavity is cleverly made by the circle gap between the exaggerated intertwining necks, therefore serving as a partial functional explanation for their exceptional exaggeration on the palette. It turns out these mythical creatures are quite typical on other Egyptian palettes and apotropaic wands carved from hippopotamus ivory, especially during the Middle Kingdom. It doesn't make sense to interpret the serpent neck cat mytheme as a dinosaur because they are always depicted with these feline features. Next up we have Bishop Bell's tomb carvings. Derek Isaacs, the creator of the famed Dinosaurs or Dragons documentary, rather flamboyantly makes this claim in his own toxin book. Now look at the seropod dinosaur. I mean it's a dead ringer. So how did they do this if they never seen one alive? Right, so people in northern England in 1496 had seen living brachiosaurs, or at least remembered seeing them. Really? First, the image that Brian showed us is pretty deceptive compared to the superior ones you can find online. Notice that even in this image that Derek shows us, you can clearly see what are pointed ears on the dragon's head. Never mind the cloven hind hooves. If you look yonder to homeboy's compadre to the left, Notice the cat-like body, and what's this? Ah, yes, another dragon head with pointed ears on its tail. Hmm, I wonder if I Google English medieval dragon illustrations, what will I get? Also close to there, another cave wall drawing of a pterosaur of some sort. It would appear to those distinctive features, the bump on the head and the webbed feet. Again, I photographed this claim being made in the Creation Museum lobby, in a display case entitled Dragon Depictions Around the World. To my knowledge, this display still stands in the museum. The same photo also appears in the organization's New Answers book. A corresponding article on the Answers in Genesis website claims, quote, In Utah San Rafael Swell, there is other suggestive evidence for man's coexistence with pterosaurs. In the Black Dragon Canyon, there is a beautiful pictograph of a pterosaur. The Indians of the Swell apparently saw a bird-like creature with enormous wings, a tail, a long neck and beak and a vertical head crest, which some flying reptiles sported. The Black Dragon Canyon pictograph is at least a thousand years old. In the 1940s, a guy named John Simonson used chalk to outline what he thought the edges of the painting were. He saw in it a winged monster. 
Although chalking was commonly practiced at the time, marking the outline of pictographs is now illegal, and Simonson's abominable white border effacing the piece is responsible for why modern creationists still maintain his interpretation. In fact, this claim became so popular that in 2015, the university rock art experts Jean-Louis Lekelic, Marvin Rowe, and Paul G. Bonn went out of their way to perform formal analysis on it. First, they used an X-ray fluorescence gun to parse out the actual boundaries of the original image. X-ray fluorescence, or XRF, is a technique that I'm trained in. It's an extremely powerful method of determining the elemental composition of a given interaction point. Essentially, you fire X-rays at a sample, these kick out electrons from the inner orbits of the sample's atoms. Then electrons from the exterior shells have to rush into place to fill in the orbital vacancy. Since every element has uniquely spaced electron orbits, by measuring the energy loss from this electron displacement, the detector and computer can tell you what the elemental composition and concentration of a sample is. For example, one of my professors, Ira Rabin, was able to end a long debate about whether some of the Dead Sea Scrolls were created in the Dead Sea region by using this technology. She found that their ink is shown to contain high concentrations of the element bromine. Since the Dead Sea region has some of the uniquely highest concentrations of bromine in the world, this shows that the carbon ink of the scroll was mixed with water from that region. Lakelic, Rowe, and Bond were able to probe the elemental concentration of the iron-rich red ochre pigment at different points throughout this painting, and they showed through variance in elemental concentration readings what the original boundaries of its application were. They found that the original elements of the image had been blurred by weathering to produce the illusion of a single image. As a final corroborating nail in the coffin, the scientists then used a digital enhancement program called D-Stretch that's specifically designed to parse out and contrast enhanced petroglyphic images, and has even been adopted to clarify Mars rover images by NASA. Essentially, D-Stretch is digitally analogous to multispectral imaging. The program algorithm is designed to contrast and exaggerate slight variations in hue in order to disassociate visual noise, then to mute it. In the decorrelation stretch that Lakelic sent me, you can clearly see that our pterosaur is actually a blurred composition of two human figures, a serpent and two quadrupeds, classic subjects depicted in the Indian Barrier Canyon style. Yeah, great job Answers in Genesis, you really nailed that one. While I'm at it, I was also confronted with this image of the Agawa rock monster petroglyph from Lake Superior in Canada because the Answers in Genesis New Answers book also cites it along with the previous image. The New Answers book specifically compares this bullhorned cryptid to Kentrosaurus or Amargosaurus. Besides the fact that this creature with a round head, ears, and buffalo horns looks almost nothing like Kentrosaurus or Amargosaurus, or any other dinosaur, the problem with this identification is that virtually every element of this rock art is already known and published. In the early 1800s, a local Indian explained to an American ethnographer that the panel commemorates the four-day crossing of the lake by a war party in five canoes. The man on horseback was their leader, whose name was Mayingun, and the creationist bullhorn Kentrosaurus is a depiction of the spirit the natives call underwater panther, or Mishnapizu. This identification is even more certain considering the location of the image on a bank of a lake and the fact that Underwater Panther is one of the most attested images among the tribes of that region, found on medicine bags and petroglyphs and on war clubs. Of these, I've produced several line details from paintings and artifacts for contextual comparison. The paleontologist Philip Sinter tells us that the name Panther is actually an archaism for the mountain lion, and that this spirit was believed to dwell in the depths of capricious lakes. Because Native Americans believed he controlled marine storms by the thrashing of his tail, they frequently petitioned the spirit, offering him sacrifices of dogs to ensure safety from their perilous voyages over large bodies of water like Superior. Sinter lists several reasons why it is foolish to mistake this mountain lion spirit for a freaking stegosaurus. To start with, the spirit is universally depicted with a round cat-like head and buffalo horns. In the Agawa painting, it clearly has ears, Finally, the creationist interpretation is pretty much almost entirely dependent on the spikes along the creature's spine. The problem here is that these lines were occasional symbolic adornments, and are frequently excluded in other depictions of similar provenance. Here's a fun one to end on as far as this subject goes. 
This is a creature uh, given to us by the Aboriginal people, and they called this creature Yaru. And they say Yaru was a real creature, it was a real menace. And in this picture, they're showing us the time that Yaru ate one of their friends. And they're trying to get their friend back or give revenge or something like that. Uh, and Yaru looks a whole lot what we call a plesiosaur. Australian Aborigines also have oral accounts of dinosaurs, and this is a picture that was drawn of a a, 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 of an encounter that the Aborigines had with a creature. Now, if you look at it, that just looks like a plesiosaurus. This image is one of the most commonly cited by young earth creationists, and I find it pretty funny. Luckily, Center again also wrote an article on this image in the Skeptical Inquirer, where he invested a lot more hours of research into tracking it down than I would have cared to. Did Australia's Aborigines see plesiosaurs? Yes, in a children's book. Quote, in 1998, the Young Earth magazine Creation published an article titled Australia's Aborigines, Did They See Dinosaurs? by Rebecca Driver. According to Driver, the painting had been donated to the Young Earth organization Answers in Genesis and had been painted by a member of the Kuku Yalanji tribe of Queensland, Australia, at the request of a missionary. According to Driver, quote, the tribal artist, with very little formal education, had no knowledge of what so-called prehistoric animals looked like, and was drawing only from the description handed down in ancient stories, end quote. Driver included the painting as evidence that humans from Australia had encountered life plesiosaurs. The painting generated much interest in young earth circles. Several young earth authors subsequently cited it as evidence of human plesiosaur coexistence. One author even asserted that the digestive tract in the painting indicated that, quote, these animals had been hunted and butchered, an assertion that others then repeated. So how could a Kukuyulanji artist depict a plesiosaur so well without his ancestors having coexisted with them, with a little help from a children's book? The Kukuyulanji painting is a copy of Rudolf Zalinger's painting of the plesiosaur Lasmosaurus, from page 47 of Jane Watson's The Giant Golden Book of Dinosaurs. The Kukuyulanji artist added the digestive tract and vertebral column, but the outline of the animal is a precise reproduction of Zalinger's painting, right down to the orientation of the neck, the bend in the middle of the left pectoral and pelvic fins, and the dome shape of the head. The fin in the painting that Gertzen mistook for a dorsal fin is actually the right pectoral fin, which the Kukuyulanji artist depicted with the same shape and dimensions as in Zalinger's painting. The Kukuyulanji painting is a poor piece of evidence that people had, quote, hunted and butchered plesiosaurs because it does not reflect accurate knowledge of plesiosaurian anatomy. In the Kukuyulanji painting, the plesiosaur's head has a dome shape, which is absent in real plesiosaur skulls, but is present in Zalinger's painting. In the Kukuyulanji painting, each of the vertebrae of the torso bears a prominent downward pointing spike, a feature absent in actual plesiosaur trunk vertebrae. Likewise, the intestine of the painting is short, broad, and straight. This is unlike the long, narrow, coiled intestines of reptiles. We also have this series of displays in the Creation Museum that imply that the monsters in Beowulf, like the main villain Grendel and his mother, might have been dinosaurs. The claim that Beowulf fought a pterosaur is ridiculous enough considering the story is about how the dragon destroys villages with its fire breath, and Beowulf has to fashion an iron shield to withstand its flames. But when it comes to Grendel and his mother in particular, these claims are especially egregious. On page 33 of the New Answers book, volume 4, Bodhi Hodge states, quote, Interestingly, in the Beowulf account, the dragon called Grendel was known to have a heavy claw on its finger, yet a fairly small arm. Beowulf was famous for ripping the arm off this dragon. The common descriptions of Grendel and Baryonyx are striking. So what's the problem with this? Well, the anthropologist Jason Calavito points out that Grendel and his mother are never depicted as reptilian in any way. They aren't actually dragons. They're described as northern giants in the line of Cain, with humanoid features and Grendel's mother is explicitly distinguished from a dragon in the text. An article by Eve Siebert, a PhD with training in Old English and Norse literature, documents how this claim that Grendel is a dragon and thus a dinosaur primarily originates from a book entitled After the Flood by Bill Cooper, vice president of the England Creation Science Movement where he based the theory on a series of patent mistranslations and misrepresentations of the Old English. Creationists have such a widespread, uncritical tradition of circulating the claim that Grendel was something like a T-Rex in their literature, most obnoxiously in homeschooling literature, that most of them simply haven't ever bothered to read the story to realize that the claim is wrong. 
This brings me to another display that I photographed in the museum, Cowboys and Dragons. This display cites a newspaper article from the late 1800s, which contains a story of how several ranchers on horseback outside of Tombstone, Arizona, between the Whetstone and Hukachua Mountains, shot and killed a giant flying reptile with membranous wings using Winchester rifles. The story is quite popular in Young Earth Creationist publications. In the New Answers book, Bodie Hodge continues, quote, It was not until the 20th century that dragons were seen as myths. In 1890, a large flying dragon was killed in Arizona in the United States, and samples were sent to universities back east. This was recorded in a newspaper under A Strange Winged Monster Discovered and Killed on the Hukachua Desert, the Tombstone Epitaph, April 26, 1890. No one seemed to entertain the idea that they were myths then. The problem here is that the important details of this account are usually ignored. Thanks to the internet, anyone with a laptop can go read the digital photograph of the scanned newspaper in full. The digitized papers are actually pretty cool to play with online. We learn that two unnamed men who were traveling home on horseback in the Hukachua Desert when they saw a giant reptile in the sky that was apparently physically exhausted in its pattern of flight. They pursued, then, quote, after an exciting chase of several miles, succeeded in getting near enough to open fire with their rifles and wounding it, end quote. The creature turned and went on the attack, but the two cowboys claimed that they evaded and landed several critical shots. The beast rolled over and died. The newspaper then continues. They then proceeded to make an examination and found that it measured about 92 feet in length, and the greatest diameter was about 50 inches. The head, as near as they could judge, was about 8 feet long. Its eyes were as large as a dinner plate, and protruded about halfway from the head. They had some difficulty in measuring the wings, as they were partly folded under the body, but finally got one straightened out sufficiently enough to get a measurement of 78 feet making the total length from tip to tip about 160 feet. The wings were composed of a thick and nearly transparent membrane, and were devoid of feathers or hair, as was the entire body. The men cut off a small portion of the tip of one wing and took it home with them. Late last night, one of them arrived in this city for supplies, and to make the necessary preparations to skin the creature, when the hide will be sent east for examination by the eminent scientists of the day. The finder returned early this morning accompanied by several prominent men who will endeavor to bring the strange creature to this city before it is mutilated. So these absurd measurements are what publish Young Earth retellings of this account often obscure or at least just simply don't acknowledge the significance of. 92 feet from head to tail, that's 28 meters for all you metric lads. Eyes as big as dinner plates, <laughs> and the 160 foot wingspan. 160 feet is 80% of the size of the wingspan of a Boeing 747. Dwayne Gish said that this thing sounds like Quetzalcoatlus, the largest flying reptile ever discovered. But Quetzalcoatlus had a wingspan roughly comparable to a fighter jet. The wingspan of the tombstone monster was claimed to be three or four times larger. So what became of the remains of this creature? Were photographs ever taken? What about the several prominent men who went to haul it back to Tombstone for display? The facts are these. This story was tucked away on page 3 of a 4 page newspaper. No photograph was ever printed of the creature, and the reporter never actually said that he saw it. Its remains were never brought to this town or to any other, and the competing Tombstone newspaper, The Nugget, never even mentioned the story. And, despite Bodhi's ridiculous claim in the Answers book, samples of it were never sent to Eastern universities. In fact, the epitaph never said anything else ever again about this 92-foot flying Godzilla in the desert, with wingspan specs comparable to an international cargo jet. Jana Bombersback's excellent investigation into the Tombstone Dragon concludes, quote, So maybe there really was a giant bird in Arizona territory at the end of the 19th century, and maybe two ranchers really did track it down and shoot it. And maybe they did come into town and get some prominent men to go help them bring it back. But whatever happened next was so unspectacular, so uninteresting, and so unremarkable that nobody ever spoke of it again. Would that have been the response if there had really been a dead dinosaur-like bird outside of town? Hardly. Now there's a lot more to gripe about in this museum besides the mundane scientific critiques that we're used to hearing. Namely, it's been a major theme of this channel to point out that most creationist organizations are seriously incompetent at academic biblical study. For example, I can't help but recall my first visit to the museum in college, when I was particularly astonished by displays like this. So here we have Moses with the Ten Commandments, and it's a total mess. The words are misplaced, they're misspelled, letters are confused for each other, the script is wildly anachronistic since it's Aramaic block script dating to after the exile instead of Paleo-Hebrew. Then of course they have vowel points in the script that weren't even invented until the Masoretes in the Middle Ages. 
After I informed the museum of the problems in this display, they did quietly end up switching out the tablets for blank ones. But I just want to point out here that this isn't an isolated instance. When you look at the organization's online videos, for example, you can bet your money that almost any time they show a Torah scroll, they tend to show the text upside down. And God's talking to Job about a specific animal, and he goes into a great amount of detail to describe this animal. In fact, it's one of the most detailed descriptions of an animal in the entire Bible. I learned that the Bible presented a very different history. The Bible says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. The Bible says the infinite creator made the building blocks of the universe, perfectly designed. Whoever made and reviewed these videos didn't even know up from down when holding a Hebrew Bible. I apologize for being pedantic, but at the same time I'm not the one running two museums about the Hebrew Bible costing a collective $130 million and serving as the main PR face for evangelicalism and science. The original T-Rex, like everything else, was vegetarian. People say, but you tell me the, the T-Rex were those big old six-inch serrated fangs, and things like fruits and vegetables. Yeah, because those teeth are perfect for tearing and ripping into things like pineapples and coconuts. Have you ever tried to bite into a coconut? That's a bad idea, isn't it? Yeah, a uh, T-Rex is just pre-equipped. He can handle it no problem. When it comes to science, mainstream young earth organizations hold extremely minority and embattled positions. They teach that T-Rex had long teeth originally to eat coconuts and watermelons, that there was originally no animal death, that humans didn't evolve, that the entire timeline consensus of modern science is essentially an international anti-god conspiracy. They teach that the Grand Canyon was carved out by the biblical flood, and that the biblical flood occurred smack in the middle of the Egyptian Old Kingdom, despite all evidence indicating that there was no break whatsoever in that civilization in this period. If these dinosaur displays in the Creation Museum, and their mainline publications and premier presentations are any indication of the level of colossal credulity, academic laziness, skepticism, or any will to use the Google search bar that these people are collectively capable of, then might I suggest that you shouldn't trust them to be mediating your scientific worldview to you. This is an embarrassment, and the fact that these people were allowed to hijack your religion for decades is no small part of the reason why evangelicalism lost the culture war and will probably never recover to its former public respectability. Don't flatter yourselves. You can't blame this one on the gospel. When the world laughs at you for endorsing this, it's not the gospel that they're laughing at.